once, in this very universe, you could say, while turning was home to a peaceful race, troll kind had never known the corrupting influence and the evolution which led them to perpetual war and violence. That is to say, they had never known me. As was true of the Belokos world we know now. There came to be twelve heroes on this peaceful planet. These heroes, too, had twelve ancestors whose fortunes were entwined with theirs. These twenty-four figures of legend were not of this world, but sent from the sky, delivered from a reality not yet conceived. On the eve of their race's extinction, the twelve heroes would begin playing a game. They would make an admirable effort, but they would fail. Their civilization had not prepared them for the bridges of this game, and the ultimate reward would fall shy of their grasp. But their failure was more comprehensive, more systematic than a result of simple inadequacy so common to young players of this game. Though they could not recognize it for the bad omen it was, this session was not the one in which they had been spawned. Such is the symptom of a subtle glitch affecting certain sessions, an error designed to trigger an unfathomable cascade of misfortune throughout Paradox Space. This glitch is the calling card of the one I serve. It is the discreet, gentlemanly manner in which he reserves his place in the universe for later visitation. The heroes, understanding that defeat was absolute, sought advice from the mother of all monsters. She offered them a choice. The heroes could either accept their defeat along with the extinction of their race, and put no others at risk. Or, she could show them a path to a second chance, to a reality in which the chosen heroes of their race would be strong enough to succeed with ease and claim the reward. This reset would come at the cost of wiping the failed heroes from existence. They would live new lives from scratch, playing different roles in the reset reality, with no memories of the game they played or the choices they made. The heroes chose to accept this bargain and scratched their session. In doing so, they jumped out of the reality in which the twenty-four figures of legend would be created, and I as well, and then sent them back in time to take our places in history. Though I was delivered well before history even began, before the dawning of life on their planet, this time around, I would oversee its development, and thus fulfill the mother's promise of an aggressive, ruthlessly prepared group of heroes, one that would not rest until victory was secured. The young twenty-four would again be scattered into two groups, twelve modern contemporaries, and twelve ancients. But in addition to losing the memories of everything that had happened before the scratch, there was another catch for the failed heroes. In the new reality, they would not serve as the heroes. They would mature to become the ancestors of the twelve formerly regarded as theirs, and this twelve would be chosen for glory. These children would be the heroes to achieve victory, and have the reward easily within reach. Of course this promise was fulfilled to the letter as you have seen. The entire bargain was executed without a single hitch, as those authorized by my master always are. There was, however, one minor anomaly. One of the failed heroes, in his new life as an ancient on this now brutal planet, began to remember. This is the story. This is the story of the Signless. Few ever knew the sufferer's given name presuming quite reasonably he had none, and he came to be called Signless. Unlike his peers distributed elsewhere in history, he was not given a sign at a young age. Alas, there were no signs reserved for one of his mutant blood. His genetic deviation from the social order made him a pariah, forcing him to wander the world alone for many sweeps, concealing the color of his blood to avoid certain execution. But it may have also been due to his mutation that he began to have the visions, spontaneous, lucid imagery of his world in peace before its fall. He would never see the complete picture, or fully understand his previous incarnation's role in prompting this fall, or know of my hand in it. But the visions showed him all he needed to see, and they held the promise of his people's true potential beneath the ages of conditioned cruelty. They held the spark of revolution. In time, the visions gave purpose to his travel. He would preach heretical ideas no one else had dared entertain, let alone risk disgusting. He espoused virtues of forgiveness, compassion, and equality among all bloodlines. He distributed his message intelligently, careful to preach only to those receptive, never attracting unwelcome attention. But his growing movement can go unnoticed by the authorities for only so long. The high bloods were livid over the unprecedented heresy, and soon a massive sectarian war followed 
spreading across the planet and throughout the galaxy. The conflict was lopsided, of course, with the High Bloods given full support from the Condess and her Seed Dwellers. Inevitably, the Simus would be captured, and when he was, it was not a matter of whether he would be put to the irons, but how hot they would be if he failed to recant. During his penance, it was said the sufferer's compassion for his people underwent a divine transformation into limitless, burning rage. It burned hotter than the iron shackling him to the Imperial flogging jet, and redder than the blood soaking his righteous leggings. When he was finally killed, his anger wrung through the cosmos with his last breath. This vast expletive was his final sermon, and somewhere in Coda and his wavelengths was the truth in his teachings, waiting to reveal itself to any who would inherit his burden. His teachings would also persist through surviving disciples, but in hushed tones. His following would dwindle to an obscure cult facing persecution for centuries. After his execution, the body was burned, leaving only his irons. They cooled in the ash as if his anger itself was subsiding, and his followers appropriated their shapes in defiance of the high bloods. The symbols became the sign of the signless, always shown as colorless as the cold iron, to conceal the stigma of his hue. This was as much a reminder to his followers to remain hidden, as it was to suffer his sacrifice and his rage hidden like heat in the irons, one day to be reignited by another of his bloodline. The sufferer preached that after he passed, another silence would come, heralding the end times for their planet. The second silence would continue his work and lead his people to glory beyond this realm. The followers kept his teachings alive for ages, even as the uproar surrounding the movement subsided. The modern times, the sufferer's scripture was little more than ancient superstition, all but forgotten. Hardly the anathema of old, but the followers had already made preparations in the shadows. And when the second silence finally came, he would have a lucis to raise him, and a sign to his name. The sufferer required a less conventional upbringing to reach maturity. As a young grub, he landed in the brooding caverns where he would be expected to face his trials. But due to his mutation, surely no lucis would select him. No creature sympathetic to his scent had been bred yet. Its odds for survival would have been remote, if not for a chance encounter. The Dolrosa belonged to a rare class, assigned strictly to serving the mother grub in the caverns, forbidden from visiting the surface. While on an errand, she found the young sufferer in his crater, and immediately recognized the child as special, as well as in great danger. For an adult troll to raise a child was unthinkable, but she saw no other hope for him. The Dolrosa abandoned her duties in the cavern, and fled to the surface to raise him. In time, she would become the first follower of his teachings, and the first of his inner circle, but not the closest. Surrounding him on his rise to infamy, and throughout the rebellion with the most trusted elite among his devoted. The Psychonic was a mage of unequal telekinetic ability, who upon hearing the words of the sufferer was inspired to free himself from the sort of slavery typical to his mentally gifted class. But his most devoted of all was his disciple. She listened to every vision he retold, every lesson he preached, and faithfully recorded his scripture. Her ear was open to him always, and in time, his heart opened to her. To spread his message throughout the world, they took to the seas in the vessel of the legend known as the First Ship. It was said their love went beyond the four quadrants, transcending the grid entirely, whatever that nonsense means. The disciple was to be killed along with him, but at the last moment, the executor inexplicably took pity on her and allowed her to escape. She absconded with the leggings, which remained the only physical evidence of his holy suffering. She hid in caves for many sweep, transcribing all of his scripture from memory on the walls in the blood of slain creatures, and lived the rest of her life in monastic savagery. Her dedication would be critical to the persistence of his message.